She can be brassy and bawdy, but she can also be vulnerable and sensitive. From wise, cracking diva to extraordinary actress, there is simply no one quite like Bette Midler. She has come a long way from the insecure little girl that grew up in Hawaii, escaping into fantasy, dreaming of one day performing and making people laugh. She got her first big break at the Continental Baths, a gay male nightclub in New York. These home movies, taken by a fan, show her performing there in 1971. It is here that her alter ego, the divine Miss M, was born. The campy torch singer's backup pianist in those days was a very unknown Barry Manilow. What followed was a one-woman show that took her around the country and finally had her star shining over Broadway. Bette told jokes, danced, sang, and in general was completely over the top. Everything about Bette Midler was totally outrageous and enormously successful. Audiences couldn't get enough of the many characters she became on stage. With each new album and stage incarnation, Bette expanded her trash with flash repartee. Soon her cult following had spread to the masses. Barely 30, she had already won a Grammy, an Emmy, and a Tony. But there was still another world to conquer, the movies. And in true Bette Midler fashion, her first time out was breathtaking. She starred in The Rose, the story of a self-destructive rock singer. Bette's powerhouse performance earned her an Academy Award nomination. When we met in 1980, I was expecting to find Bette Midler riding the wave of her immense 15 years success. Instead, I found a woman at the crossroads. Her mother had recently passed away. Bette had split with her manager of 10 years. She was surprisingly unsettled, living in a rented house and seemingly had no clue as to what she was going to do next. Lots of things have happened to you this year, almost too much. I mean, it's as if, you, as if everything has come together, the enormous success in The Rose, and yet the kind of work that you had to put into it. Your one-woman show, uh, The Death of Your Mother, mm -hmm. the giving up of your manager, Aaron Russo, who had been with you for years. Mm -hmm. Where are you now? What has this all done? Well... I'll tell you, it's really rough. This is not funny. This is a lot of work. And it's terribly exhausting, to be quite frank. Mm. I uh, don't like to, to talk about it, but I'll... Uh, this has been very, very hard on me the last, the last, this last year. I, there was a couple of times I really thought I was going to go under. I was ready to call the men in the white suits. It's an awful lot of work, and I had no idea before I decided I would do it myself. I mean, I had no idea what Aaron really did. You mean really keeping did. your, in terms of doing without the manager? Yeah. How did you keep from falling apart? I don't really know that I have. Now you, that, you ha that you've kept from falling apart? I don't think I have kept from falling apart. I think I'm very close to falling apart. But I don't care, you know. You have to, you can always get up and pick up the pieces. It's not like I'm going to die or anything. What that much I've learned. In, okay, what might happen? Well, I could, ju I could make a lot of wrong choices, but you know, mm -hmm. it's a, a career is a career, you know, you have good, you good choices, you have bad choices. But that's career. Yeah. That's good. what a career is all about. You know, some things you do well, some things you don't do so well, but you take your medicine and you learn and you plow on, if the career indeed means that much to you. Does your career mean that much no, to you? No, it doesn't. Yeah. What matters to me is the work, is the work itself is the art part. I like the part, that part. I don't like the business part. I don't have a head for it. What about and I find it creeping into the other areas. That's what I'm trying to say. That I don't like that. I don't like being a mogul. I don't want to be a mogul. I want to be... I, I, I don't have that... Uh, I just don't have that kind of a head. I have a head for jokes and songs and d dances mm -hmm. and clothes mm -hmm. and shoes yeah. and background singers and bands, musicians, I can, that's what I understand. I understand that. I understand the art of it, but I don't understand the business of it. It's just like, yeah. I think you have to take a course or something. You have to go to school for it. You know, learn how to be an accountant. 
the line, it's always been said, between comedy and tragedy is a very slim line. Mm -hmm. And you also have said that people who are sad are people who try to be funny. Mm -hmm. This is all you? This is, I would say that was pretty, pretty accurate. I don't dwell on it too much, mm -hmm. except when I'm really alone. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has a certain amount of sorrow in their lives. Uh, they don't all become funny. No, no, they don't. Uh, it depends on what the sorrow is, I suppose. Yeah. You're very compassionate on stage yes. to older people, yes. older women. I mean, some of the most touching numbers you do about the bag lady, the old mm -hmm. lady, the old people. Yeah, yes. Where did this come from? I, you know, I tell you, I don't really know. I have a funny way of looking at things. I, I have a, I don't know what caused it, but I've always been, uh, I've always felt sorry for human beings. I've always felt real, real, real sorrow for them, for their, uh, I don't know where it came from. Uh, that's the side of me that is the deepest, that, that is the, that's the biggest part of my life, is this feeling that I have that it's, isn't it too bad that we are human beings? Because human beings really aren't very nice, you know? And they have all the equipment to be grand and noble, mm -hmm. and yet they never make use of it. And everywhere I turn, I see it, and it makes me, it just makes me sad. I don't know. So then you go out on the stage, and then, and I, and then I make them laugh, and it's better for a while, you know? Because it's better for me when I laugh, you know? I, I really love a good laugh. I haven't had one in a dog day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know I feel better when I laugh, and it, it lifts me up out of that, you know? It seems when one sees you on stage and talking to you off stage that you have, I don't know how to, you have compassion for the oddballs. The oddballs knock you out. Mm-hmm. I do. I just, everywhere I turn, I see them. And you're an oddball. I am an oddball. I'm definitely odd. I'm up there with them big, big odd ones. <laughs> yep. I, I, sometimes I get fairly strange ones in the crowd, too. But I don't, uh... Yeah, I do have a compassion for it because I know what it's like to be inside that body. I know what it's like to have that have that, that little voice, you know, it's stuck inside a body that you and you don't understand how you got trapped there. You being, you know, your your soul or your personality. Um, go ahead. Did you feel that way when you were a kid? Yeah, I always did. I always felt a part. Never felt like I belonged. That's why I think I I went I go so far to make people laugh and sort of give them comfort too, you know by saying, look at what a nutcase I am, yet I go on. I know in your book you said that you can't stand it when people ask you about your childhood and about Hawaii, but it is not your average childhood. Uh, we were a, a, a white family in a, a neighborhood that was n m mostly non-white. Uh, in Honolulu? In Honolulu, just on the outskirts of Honolulu, in the what they used to call it, the sticks of Honolulu. It's a freeway now. The whole town is a freeway. It's so bizarre because there's nowhere to go on that island. They just have a road that goes around and around and around. Um, they were Japanese and Chinese and uh, Filipinos and Samoans and Hawaiian Chinese and, um, and Portuguese. And it was, um, we were the only real straight ahead white family and Jewish to boot. And it was, we were made to feel very uncomfortable. And um, you were the funny looking kid. I was a funny looking were kid. Were you really funny looking? Well, I wore these, mm, I wore mm, glasses, you know, the kind with mm, the little cat's eyes, and uh, for, uh, they weren't on a chain. Thank God they weren't on a chain. <laughs> <laughs> it was bad, but it wasn't that bad. They, um, and I had, you know, I had my little frizzy hair, and, and uh, I tell you, these glasses it really, really murdered my love life. Really, really rough. I was playing, I had a big chest, you know. I was very developed for a, I started developing early, and you know, in those days, I don't know what it's like now, but in those days, Jesus, they used to just murder you if you, if you, the kids would just, were just merciless if you were starting to develop a figure. Even the, the girls, I mean, they were like, Ugh, bitter women, bitter little women, bitter children. <laughs> <laughs> like they had picked up all this hideousness from their parents or something, you know? And, um... Uh, How so did I you got a lot of it. I used to get a lot of it because first I was white, then I was this strange thing called Jewish, and then I had this set of knockers, you know, I mean, that would, used to just infuriate them. What do you think of the way you look? I think I look great. 
No, no kidding. No Why kidding. do I say no kidding? That's yeah, good. hey. Because, <laughs> hey, hey, get out of my I house. Ask you, would you say that to Bo Derek? Yeah. Because everything that I've read about you, you always talk oh, about well, how when you were a kid, you thought you were so ploy. ugly. Right. You really think you're just... just I think I look great. Just a, ploy, just a plea for sympathy. Right. So you should always get the crowd on your side, you know. You think you're sexy? I know I'm sexy, but I don't, I shouldn't say that in public, because people don't, people get pissed off. I mean, excuse me, people that get like, well, who is she? But, uh, and I don't mean it like that. You know the, the film Ten? Yes. On the scale of one to ten, what are you? What am I, on a scale of one to ten? Oh, I, I think I'm about a 55. I don't know. <laughs> I think I'm a happening girl. I think I'm happening. I mean, if I didn't think I was happening, I mean, why would I ever bother get, get up in the morning? I think I'm happening. People who are not on stage and have never seen, as most of us have not, those, those hundreds or thousands of people in front of them, what is it like? It's the greatest. It's, uh, there's nothing like it in the whole world. It's, uh, if, you, if you're doing well, if you're doing, the, doing what you're supposed to do and it's right, they know it and they give you back so much affection and, uh, and, and love. And it's sort of like, it's reciprocal and it goes on, it can go on for two and three hours. It's the most marvelous feeling, you know? It's like sailing. I've done a couple of shows recently that were real, sailing shows, you know, that start, you didn't have any idea when they were going to be over because they were so grand, you know, and I was having so much fun I didn't want to quit. I think people, when they come to see me, they come to see um, the energy and they come to see, uh, they come to see me run, you know, run, because I do run on the stage, mm -hmm. but the parts that I like best are the parts where I get to, you know, sort of sing ballads and 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 uh, sing the blues and and sort of bare my breast that sort of thing I mean not literally in the figurative sense that too that too well once or twice I have been carried yes, away I have heard that once was recently at the London Palladium well I thought that was very chic it was they just loved it they said they were all sort of sitting in the balcony one night and they had this one group of them, I guess they were from, uh, they kept saying they were from Liverpool. I keep trying to get the accent in my head, but I don't really have it. Uh, they had a, a big, all the way across the balcony, cards that said, we love Bette Midler, and they spelled my name wrong. Um, and then they turned the cards around and they said, we love your, you know, anatomy, your, you know, your chest. And so I, that, it made me laugh. I thought it was hysterical. <laughs> I thought it was just hysterical. And so I, I was wearing something that was rather sort of loose anyway, so I sort of gave them a jolt. In real life? It made me laugh. <laughs> I love it when they can, if they can make me laugh, I will, you know, I don't care. If it's the right moment, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes that's the, the best thing to do is to flash them. You know, it's that's like they'll never forget it. They go home and they'll say, you'll never guess what I want. What the crazy? Yeah, right. But I don't do it too often because it's not, not in good taste. In my... <laughs> <laughs> you don't want them to come and expect it, you know. You want to sort of like, you want to... Uh... <laughs> Are you in real life? Are you a prude? Oh, I'm terribly prudish. But there's something about getting out on the stage that fills me with this, this, this desire. Not uh, this... Uh, desire is the wrong word. It fills me with this determination just to surprise and, and, um... Uh, Shock? Yeah, sometimes, yes. Sometimes. Recently. Recently, I find that. I didn't used to, I did, when I, when I was first working, or rather, just a few years ago, recently I don't... Can I start again? Just say it, come on. That windowsill is perfectly filthy. Yeah, well, we'll clean up oh, later. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get up, we'll do a few things, we'll rinse out a few things. Okay. Take care of you. Uh, what's the question? Shock. Yeah. Oh, oh, when I first started, oh, and a, new, and a fake fact, fact too. Oh, I'm Not sorry. in my time. <laughs> I'm just realizing <laughs> what's going on. Um, wait now, when I first, uh, I never thought about shocking people at all. I, when I first started working, but recently, like, just the last job that I did, uh, I found myself you know, like coming, things were started coming out of my mouth. I don't, I could, I, it's like I, I was another person. Like I couldn't control them. It was very odd. But not privately? Not privately, no, no. Could you do your shows without being vulgar? Um, 
<clears throat> I could do a show without being vulgar. <laughs> I don't know if I could do my show without being vulgar. It says it has it's uh, it has it's the very thin line once again between the good taste and the bad taste that I walk. I think that uh, um, I think I do what I do very well because I I have a real inbred innocence about about what it is that I do about my own particular vulgarity and I find it find it. I have a good sense of humor about yeah. lowbrow comedy yeah. and towards it. And uh, I think that the vulgarity really is sort of part of it. First of all, because I'm a woman. You know, a man can say anything and get away with it. Mm -hmm. But when it comes out of a, the mouth of a woman, it has to be tempered with a certain amount of innocence. And, and uh, that's what I do. When you're on the stage, there is that incredible energy. I mean, it just, where does it come from? Um, well, I get, my family's that way. It's a high metabolism. It's, a, it's chemical. Part of it is chemical, and the other part of it is just sheer desperation. And need, you know, need. But I think, but most of that is gone, you see, because I have had so much success mm -hmm. that most of that need is gone. I sort of miss it. You know, it's that it's the need to convince and to and to to to, uh, uh, to convince people that you are what uh, as great as they want you to be. Do you, you think know? you're great? I think some things I do great. I think some things I don't do so great. <laughs> what do you do great? I think I'm very funny yeah. on the stage. I think I'm I'm a scream. I've seen a lot of t tape on myself, and I can be pretty funny. I mean, I have a very malleable face. I have a clown's face. Uh, I think also I have the ability to move people and to convince and to and to and to. I see. I have no my personal it, my personality really is. I'm really like a blackboard. And, and whatever I can think of, I can I can put out on the screen or on the stage. I've always been that way. But I'm just personal personality-wise, I'm like nothing. I mean, I don't have a personality. In real life, you don't. In real life, I don't have one. I have to like charge it up, and you know. I mean, really, I I'm just I'm an actor. I am an actor, and most actors are really like just bare. You've never been married. Never been married. Want to be married? No, but I think I'd like to have children. Would you? Yeah. What kind of a mother would you be? Oh, I think I'd be a great mother, because I, 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 because uh, I have compassion. Mm -hmm. You know. What would you? And I like to teach, <laughs> like John. I like to teach. Do material things mean anything to you? I mean, you've made some money. I made some money. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah, I made some money. Are there things that you're dying to buy? No. The possessions you want to have? No. You're, no. Really? I no no, just books, books and records. There are those who say you like and other people. Cheap? Who said cheap. I'm cheap? Cheap, cheap. Some Must of the people, people who work for me. you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got that line straight. <laughs> Are you cheap? Cheap, the worst. Why? Well, honey, I'll tell you the truth. If I, everybody out there is listening knew what I had to pay for the kind of service that I required, they would say I was not cheap. Are you hard to work with? I'm hard to work with when I don't, when the picture that I have in my mind is not shared by the people that I'm working with. When the people I'm working with don't understand my vision mm. or what I'm going for, you know, that, that's when I get terribly frustrated and I do, I am a screamer. I am definitely a screamer. Definitely. But I don't, I, it's only when I'm just shoved up against the wall that I start to scream. But I do it because I'm frustrated and not out of real malice or, or, um, attitude. I'm not a prima donna. I am definitely not a prima donna. I, if I do say so myself. What do you like most about yourself? The fact that I'm not a prima donna. <laughs> what do you like least about yourself? <laughs> the fact that I'm not a prima donna. <laughs> the fact that I can't I learn to be a prima donna, damn it. When you fantasize now, though, I mean, if you think of the future, what do you say? What I don't you, fantasize. You don't, yeah. I don't fantasize. This is as far as the fantasy got me. Mm -hmm. This was the fantasy. This was the fantasy. I'll yeah. make the movie, I'll be on the stage, now what? Now what? That was the yeah. fantasy. Now I gotta go find, go find another fantasy, you know? Is the best yet to come, or have you been there already? I think this is it. Do you really? I do, but I don't think At it's 34, bad. you think that this is it? Well, I'd like, well, yeah. You're not gonna get higher, it's not gonna get better. Is there any more? Yeah. What else is there? 
Then what else do I, what would I want to do? What, I mean, look what are you going to do did. from 34 to 90? I have no idea. You mean I have to go on? <laughs> um, do you, you catch me at a very peculiar point in my life because everything so thus far has been leading up to this moment, and here I am. I know. I know we have. I mean, I knew when we came to do the interview that this was a very particular time with everything that's been the best and mm -hmm. with some of the things that have been the worst. And mm -hmm. we really have gotten, you know, if we wanted to be corny, at the crossroads. Really, at the crossroads. Yeah. And we don't know which way you're going She's to... She's standing right in the middle. She's not moving an inch. 